Hey everyone, my name is Natasha and I'm a software developer at A Cloud Guru. Video transcoding plays a huge part in our students' experience when using the A Cloud Guru platform. Today, I'm going to share with you the tale of how we do transcoding, uh, starting from the very beginning up until current implementation today. We'll look at problems and trade-offs that we encountered along the way and how we can improve on our current implementation. If you're looking to implement or improve on a video transcoding service, I hope you find these insights helpful. So first, I'll give you a quick overview. If you haven't heard of a cloud guru, we provide quality content for our students to upskill themselves in cloud technologies. And the company was born back in 2015 by two brothers, Sam and Ryan Cronenberg. It's since grown and we acquired Linux Academy in 2019 and have since taught 2.2 million students and counting. The first version of a Cloud Guru was built on a completely serverless architecture in just four weeks, uh, utilizing AWS. Since then, the engineering team has grown and we've built out more serverless services to support features for our students. Our students who come from all over the world can then watch our content on either desktop, tablet, or the mobile app. And right now we have 340 courses with 11,050 individual lessons, as well as 26 web series videos containing 503 individual web series videos. We've recently added hands-on labs content as well. So that adds an extra 1500 videos on top and we continue to update our catalog. Each video can range from two to 20 minutes, depending. So that's a lot of video content. Let's also talk about what transcoding is and why it's important. So at a very high level, video transcoding is the process of changing a video's original source format to another, usually downscaling it to a more reasonable resolution or format for the end device. The process itself involves decoding a video from its original format to a decompressed format and then encoding the uncompressed data into the desired format. So why do we need different video formats and resolutions? We want to make viewing our content compatible across multiple devices, be it PC, tablet or mobile. And most importantly, to make sure our users are having the best experience possible on the device that they're using. You can imagine a user viewing a HD video on their phone in an area with a poor connection will be pretty bad experience. So the more options we have available, the more users and devices we can reach and the better the experience for everyone. So now let's go through the journey of transcoding one chapter at a time. Of course, a cloud guru didn't start off with such high numbers of video content in the beginning, and we also didn't have a mobile application at this point. So in the beginning, in 2015, video transcoding was a manual process. The team would upload a video to an application called Handbrake, and then Handbrake would return the transcoded video files. Needless to say, before long, a new approach was needed. So we decided to introduce Elastic Transcoder, AWS's media transcoder in the cloud. It transcodes media files from one format to various other formats that can be played across multiple devices. Elastic Transcoder also provides transcoding presets for popular output formats. So you don't need to try and guess which formats work best for specific devices. So whether it's an iPhone, Samsung, or a Kindle, it caters for those different devices. In terms of cost, you pay for the minutes that you spend transcoding and the resolution that you transcode at. If you want to have a play with this, there is a free tier. So I think you can transcode 20 minutes of standard definition video or 10 minutes of high definition video um, per month, free of charge. Elastic Transcoder manages all of the transcoding process for you, so you don't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure. So Elastic Transcoder is built up of four components. We've got jobs. So jobs do the transcoding and they can transcode files in up to 30 different formats. And then you've got pipelines. And pipelines are the queues that manage the transcoding jobs. 
it can process multiple jobs at the same time and starts processing jobs in the order that they were added to the pipeline. And then you've got presets. And I mentioned these presets before, but you can pick a template with some predefined settings based on what transcoding job you want to do, or you can create your own. And finally, we've got notifications. So you can use SNS to notify you of specific events, like the status of a job. So maybe it's still processing or it's been completed or there's been an error. With that in mind, let's carry on with the story. So in the same year, 2015, a revamp of the transcoding process took place. The initial process was totally manual and it was about time to automate it. Typically, a content creator on our platform will need to convert an MP4 of 1080p. And 1080p is full high definition resolution. When a user watches one of our videos on a desktop, the quality by default is set to 780p, which is standard high definition. We also provide the 1080p and a lower 480p as a playback option for our users. So let's go through the process. Our content team would go to upload an MP4 file from our editor UI, which would then upload it into our S3 input bucket. The file name has the data encoded into it, so it might look something like this on the left. So course slash the course name, uh, AWS CCP, slash section slash component, because you'd have multiple videos that make up different sections of the course. The upload to the input bucket would trigger a Lambda function. It will be triggered on an object created event in the input S3 bucket. And the Lambda would write out to Firebase with a processing status that it's kicked off a new job for this file. It will then pass the S3 object key as an input to the transcoder to process the MP4. Elastic Transcoder would then place the transcoded videos in the formats that we specified into an output S3 bucket. It's important to note that the configurations that we wanted to transcode our videos to were fixed in the source code at this point. Then we had a Lambda that was triggered off of an object created event in the output S3 bucket. This would then go and update Firebase with a transcoding job status set to complete. Firebase has web sockets, so as this process is happening, data was being resynced to the browser. When the transcoder was working in the background, the status was being updated in Firebase, and then Firebase was then pushing the status to the browser as it was happening. Finally, for any students watching on the platform, they'd be accessing this content via a signed URL, which lasts for 48 hours, and they'd be watching an MP4 of 1080p, 780p, or 480p, depending. So what are the problems with this approach? At this point, we were introducing web series, and this solution is tightly coupled to courses and to Firebase. We knew we wanted to have different types of content aside from courses, and this isn't generic. Another issue is that the data is encoded into the file name. So this implementation will pass the data around the service based on the name of the file. This is how we know the file is part of a specific video in a specific course. And this is how the Firebase hierarchy was determined. Because we're using the hierarchy of course, course name, section, component, each time we read and write to Firebase, we're traversing the structure to update that content. And again, it's tightly coupled to courses. S3 supports metadata. So what we could have done is added this data as key value pairs rather than extracting it from the file name. Another issue is that the video presets were hard coded in the source code. So we couldn't add arbitrary data throughout the process. So if you wanted to transcode a video with different configurations each time, you couldn't do that because the preset was hard coded. And we didn't have anything like DynamoDB to store any additional data. 
literally all you had was the file name being passed in the Lambda function. So how do we move away from this? So let's look at chapter three. We knew we wanted to have different types of content and the previous implementation tightly coupled courses to Firebase. So we decided to decouple the types of content. So now we have different services for different types of content and a service for transcoding the content itself. So we've got the content service, which is very generic. It doesn't know if a video is course or web series material or about the series or course service itself. All it cares about is the transcoding job. So the browser calls the content service to create a piece of content and this content service returns a content ID. This content ID is then associated to a web series or a section in a course, depending on the content. Next, let's have a look at the content service itself and break down what's happening there. The content service in this diagram is a service with GraphQL endpoints that trigger lambdas that then talk to specific AWS services. I'm representing it with a GraphQL logo here. So from the content editor UI, we'd create a new piece of content via a GraphQL endpoint, which would then go and write this new content to DynamoDB. For this API call, we're able to specify the video format or definitions that we want. So we could pass 780p, 480p or MP3, whereas in the previous implementation, we couldn't do that because it was hard coded. Next, the content service creates a pre-signed URL so that the content can only be uploaded by content editors to our input S3 bucket. Now we do the transcoding. So we send a request to Elastic Transcoder to start a job to start transcoding the content. Now Elastic Transcoder will get the video is being requested to transcode from the input bucket and put the transcoded video files into an output bucket once the job is complete. As the transcoding process is happening, Elastic Transcoder is giving us a job status, which is then being updated in DynamoDB. So for example, once the transcoding job has finished, it sends that status in a payload of an SNS topic. And then the Lambda subscribed to that SNS topic would go and update DynamoDB. As this is happening, the browser is polling for updates to update the UI on the processing status. This replaces the web sockets that could be used with Firebase, but we're using Dynamo over Firebase now, um, so that's the trade-off here. So once the job is done, the transcoded videos are placed in the output bucket that CloudFront fronts with signed URLs for the video content. So this makes sure the content is only accessible to members of the platform. So what are the problems that we face with this current approach? Uh, most of the solution is in CloudFormation, but not all of it. The Elastic Transcoder is not a supported resource, so we did have to set that up manually in the console. And plus the Elastic Transcoder service is outdated. There is a new service that I'll talk about in just a second. So having come this far and the changes that we've made, what have we achieved? Well, we've managed to centralize our videos through the content service. Every bit of video content, regardless of what it's for, so web series, course, or now hands-on labs, it all uses the same interface to be transcoded. So we've moved away from that tightly coupled solution before. So how can we improve on our current implementation? Well, we'd look to rewrite some of chapter two. Elastic Transcoder has become outdated. Um, it was the first AWS service to be able to transcode media files, uh, but there is a new kid on the block called AWS Elemental Media Convert. So Media Convert can do the same thing as Elastic Transcoder and more. It supports more input and output formats, as well as HEVC and H.264 compression standards. Elastic Transcoder only supports H.264. It has other new capabilities, such as video quality improvements 
codex and other add-on features. It is available in CloudFormation, so we'd be able to have a full infrastructure as code solution, which is awesome. You can generate transcoding jobs in CloudFormation as well as presets and queues. It has a similar pricing model, so you can pay as you go and pay for what you use. And the rates are based on the duration of video output. Using Media Convert is significantly cheaper though, so it would definitely help with our transcoding bills each month. I think for standard definition per minute of video output, Media Convert costs $0.0075, while Elastic Transcoder costs 0.015. So there's definitely a few pros there for switching to Media Convert from our current implementation. So this leads us to the end of our story for now. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for listening and feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and I look forward to answering any questions that you might have.